We're in Acts chapter 18, and in this chapter, the Apostle Paul comes to the city of Corinth, Greece. Let's find out what happened there. Verse one, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader and his entire household believed in the Lord and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. This is God's word. Please be seated. Do you know what command God gives in the Bible more than any other command? Is it honor your father and mother? That's in the Bible eight times. That's a lot. Is it you shall not steal? That's in the Bible nine times. But actually there's a command given to God's people in the Bible that is there over 100 times. And that command is, do not be afraid. Paul, uh, the, the Lord says it over and over to, to God's people in, in dangerous and uncertain times. He speaks that word to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses and to Joshua. He says it to David. He says it to the good kings of Judah. You find this word in the prophets, in the Psalms. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke this, this command, do not be afraid. And here's the one place in the life of the apostle Paul where God speaks to him and says, Paul, do not be afraid. So was Paul afraid? That seems out of character and yet he was. He admits that he was afraid. Paul, as you know, left Corinth and he wrote two letters back to the Corinthian church. They're in our Bible, first and second Corinthians. And in the first letter, Paul admits, when I first came to you brothers, I came in weakness and in fear and much trembling. So what was it about Corinth that made Paul afraid? Paul had faced obstacles and, and resistance before, but what was it about this city that caused his fear? Well, we don't know for sure, we can only speculate, but there's some things that historians tell us about the city of Corinth. First is that this was easily the wealthiest city that Paul had ever been to in his missionary journeys. Corinth was an immensely prosperous city. There was a great deal of money being made in Corinth. If you look on a map, you can see why Corinth was situated on this narrow strip of land between Northern Greece and the Peloponnese, Peloponnese Peninsula in the south. And so all trade North and South had to go through Corinth. 
Corinth also had a port in the east on the Aegean Sea, a port in the west on the Adriatic Sea, and rather than sailing around the bottom of Greece, shipping companies would unload their cargo in one port, they would haul it through Corinth and load it into empty ships on the other side, and so Corinth was literally a crossroads north and south, east and west of all trade in Greece. Lots of money being made in that place. Corinth was also a city proud of its identity. It had been rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, and he had given the residents of Corinth Roman citizenship. And so that carried with it a great deal of pride. And as Pastor Rob has pointed out in this sermon series, that citizenship was also tied very closely to the worship of the Roman pantheon of gods and to the acknowledgement of Caesar as Lord. And then Corinth was also a city that was notorious for sexual immorality. There was a hill outside the city. On top of it was an ancient temple to Aphrodite, Venus, the goddess of love. And Greek historians in antiquity spoke of a thousand prostitutes that served this temple who would come down into this wealthy city full of merchants at night. It's telling that in all the letters that Paul wrote to different churches, it's only to to the Corinthian church that Paul, Paul feels compelled to tell men in the church, you're a Christian now, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, you can't visit prostitutes. And so Paul, of course, knowing the character of this city and knowing his, his message of sin and judgment and heaven and forgiveness and repentance and the cross and Christ, he, he knew these are people who love money and who are very prideful of their identity and who are enmeshed in immorality. My message is gonna go over like a lead balloon. And so how did this affect Paul? What, was the, what effect was this fear having on him? Well, verse nine gives us a clue. God, the, the, the Lord says, Paul, do not be afraid. Keep speaking, do not be silent. Which indicates that the way this fear was affecting Paul was a temptation in some way to pull back in his speech. Now, I kind of doubt that meant for Paul that he was soft peddling his message. Perhaps it was more like this, that Paul had this little group of people who were believers. He had, he had this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, this man Crispus and his family, this Roman man, Titius Justus in his home and some others. And perhaps Paul said, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna focus my attention on this little group of believers. I'm just gonna focus on teaching them, discipling them. I'm not gonna get out there because I know how it's gonna received, be received. And God comes to him and says, do not be afraid, keep speaking, do not be silent. Now this is important to note about this command that's given so often in the Bible, do not be afraid. When God says to us, to his people over and over again, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, the command is not, do not have feelings of fear. You're in a dangerous situation or some uncertain situation. The command is not, don't you dare have feelings of fear or feelings of of anxiety. No, if you look in every place this command is given, you look at the context. What God is commanding is, don't allow your fear to dominate you. Don't allow it to paralyze you. Don't allow it to keep you from saying or doing the things that you are called to do as one of my people. Time and again, that's the way that this command is used. And it's very clear that that's the case here with Paul. Well, all of us as Christians face uh, uncertainty, don't we? And danger and fear is a reality. Maybe like Paul, you also are fearful right now of some of the big cultural and and political forces. Uh, You're fearful maybe for the future, for your grandchildren. Maybe the fears that you have are a little bit closer to home. Maybe there are fears that you are wrestling with in your own family or marriage or financial fears or fears regarding your health. All of those fears can have a paralyzing effect on us as believers. And so this word comes to us as a powerful message. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. So how do we do it? How do we master our fears, so to speak, so that we can continue to do and say what God wants us to. Well, we do so by claiming and appropriating the promises of God. 
That's exactly how God addresses Paul. He gives him three wonderful promises and we have to take these promises and kind of push them down deep into our hearts so that they catch on fire and then enable us to uh, master our, our fears. So what are these promises that God gives Paul in this vision? Now you might say, well, I wish I had a vision. You know, if God gave me a vision, then I wouldn't be afraid. Well, that's not how it works. God has given these visions to his prophets and his apostles, and they come to us in the word of God. And this word to Paul is a word to you. And so what, is, what are these promises? Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. The first promise is because the Lord is with you. Bible says that over and over again, that the Lord is with you. Remember Jesus says, make disciples of all nations and lo, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. What does that mean that God is with us? I I run on the beach in the morning and there's this woman, I've I've talked to her once. She's a practitioner of some Eastern religion and is doing her, her rituals there. And I imagine that if I ask her, hey, is the Lord with you? She would probably say, yes, you know, he is, he is in me, you, he is in me, he is in the tree. But that's not what we mean when we say the Lord is, is, is with us. It's not like God is this aura that's around and he's, he's sort of everywhere. He is present with us. The way that the, the Old Testament often expresses this is in terms of, of body parts. God's presence is his face. David says, where can I go from, in Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Where can I go from your face? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go to the depths, you're there. Remember David says, if I, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And so David tries to communicate God with us as God's face. His face is right here. His hand is upon us. And all of this, of course, is pointing forward to the great demonstration of God with us in Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, when God took on human nature and lived among us. And so this is one of the great promises that we have to appropriate when we're afraid is that God is with us. Now, of course, there's a challenge to that because we can't see God and we can't see Jesus. He's ascended into heaven. He's invisible. And so God knows that. And so as an aid to us and as an encouragement, he has given us, we might even say a physical manifestation of his presence. And what is that? What does Paul have that God gives him in this chapter? He gives him two great Christian friends. And Luke takes time at this beginning to to share with us some of the details of the formation of this tremendous friendship that Paul had with this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Luke talks about how they met. Paul's out of funds. He goes into the marketplace to get some contract work. He's got a, Paul's not just a scholar. He's also has a, a, a trade. He's a tent maker. He meets this couple. They're believers. They're Jews like he was from the dispersion. We're even told how they've gotten to Corinth. There was this edict by the Emperor Claudius expelling the Jews from Rome. And so they had come to Corinth. You can Google that if you want to read about that, that uh, account. All that is to say, God choreographed this. He orchestrated bringing the Apostle Paul in a time of fear to this wonderful couple who became deep friends with him. At one point, Paul writes in one of his letters, Aquila and Priscilla saved my life. So what does this mean for you if you're fearful? Listen, you've got to take hold of the promise that God is with you. You have to believe that. You have to, to hold on to it. But there's also another application, and that is that if you're a believer, you should make every effort to be a good Christian friend. God is gonna use you in the lives of fellow believers who are fearful, to use you to say, uh, hang in there, keep speaking. God's with you, I'm with you, I'll pray for you, let's pray together. It's one of the ways that God enables us to overcome our fear. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent because the Lord is with you. And then the second promise is because the Lord will keep you from harm. He says to Paul, no one is going to attack you to harm you. Maybe this was kind of the heart of of Paul's fears that he was gonna get a, a very brutal attack. God doesn't say no one's gonna attack you. He says no one's gonna attack you to harm you. 
and Paul gets attacked at the end. They, they, the Jews all come together and they drag him into court. I think it's worth figuring out what's going on here. It says that they were bringing a charge against him that he was teaching people to worship God in ways that were contrary to the law. What, what, did, what did that mean? You have to realize that in the Roman Empire, there was no freedom of religion, or maybe you should say freedom of conscience. People were expected to to honor and worship the Roman pantheon of gods. People were expected to say Caesar is Lord. But the Romans were were, uh, pragmatists. They had, uh, for reasons of political expediency, they had this big empire to govern. And so they had a category, legal religions. And some religions, they allowed people to practice. And if you were in a legal religion, you didn't have to do all the Roman worship. You didn't have to worship the Roman gods. Judaism was the biggest and most famous legal religion. And so Jews didn't have to say Caesar is Lord and pray to Caesar. They prayed for him, but not to him. And so what they were accusing Paul of is that he is advocating another religion. And he's breaking Roman law in this way. They're trying to get him in trouble. And so this Roman proconsul listens, and you can almost hear his thinking. He listens to to, to their presentation. He's looking over here. Paul's clearly a Jew. They're arguing about Jewish stuff. Who's the Messiah? How do you keep the law? The, The Roman legal religion law didn't differentiate between different Jewish denominations. If you were a Jew, you were a Jew and 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 your religion was legal. And so Gallio says, hey, this is an intramural debate, and he throws them out of court. We know a significant amount about this man, Gallio, from other sources. He was the younger brother of Seneca, the, the Roman philosopher. He was a man who was highly regarded for his legal mind and his decisions. And this decision in Acts 18 set a precedent that lasted for over 10 years. And what that meant was that during this time when the church is is, is small and tender and, and weak, it was protected under this legal religion law. In other words, the Roman authorities looked at early Christianity as just another branch of Judaism. And so it was protected. Now, later on, Nero, you know, got rid of that and he began to, to persecute Christianity as a separate religion. But, but here's my point. Isn't this wonderful? That the Lord himself had total control over this decision by this pagan Roman governor. And the Lord used it and orchestrated it for his own purposes for the growth of the church. How wonderful that is. That should keep us from being afraid. There are no forces out there, whether they're legal or or political or cultural, that the Lord is not capable of bending and moving and guiding to accomplish his purposes for his people. We shouldn't be afraid of them. But there is one kind of unanswered question in this promise that the Lord will keep you from harm. And that is, well, what about when it seems like he doesn't keep us from harm? I mean, Paul's delivered here, but later on we know from history that Paul was executed by the Romans. Where's God keeping him from harm there? And we can look around the world at plenty of examples. I mean, there are three generations of North Korean Christians have been crushed under the dictatorship of the the Kim dynasty. Where's God's promise there? Many of you know Peter Brundage, a member of this church. Peter passed away last month. I was visiting him in the hospital and we read Psalm 121. And the last verse in Psalm 121 says, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. And Peter said, I have a hard time reconciling that promise. The Lord will keep you from all harm with my life experience. He said, I've, I've suffered things that have brought great pain into my life. And I've wondered, where is God's promise in that? And then he answered his own question. He said, well, the answer is the last line. It says, the Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. And he said, I've come to realize the promise of no harm is a forevermore promise. In everything I've suffered, my soul has not been harmed. My relationship with God as my heavenly father has not been harmed. My place in heaven has not been harmed. And he said, I'm looking forward to the day when I see God and he wipes away every tear from my eyes. And of course, four days later, he was in heaven. 
That is the promise here that God will keep you from all harm. It is a forever promise. Sometimes God works like he did in, in Paul's case here in Acts 18. Sometimes you, you pray about something and, and, and things happen and things start moving and circumstances change and wow, you see that God delivered you from that. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you hurt. But in the end, forevermore, he will keep you from harm and wipe away every tear. So listen, you have to take that promise and appropriate it. You have to cling to it when you're afraid. When you're tempted not to speak, when you're tempted not to do what you know God wants you to do, hold on to that promise. Do not be afraid. <clears throat> keep on speaking. Do not be silent. The Lord is with you. The Lord will keep you from harm. And then the last promise, the Lord has many people in Fort Lauderdale. God says to Paul, I've got many people in this city, in Corinth. But Paul's looking at this city and he sees a city full of wealthy people who love money and making money more than anything, a people who are prideful of their identity and would not do anything, claim any sort of faith that would, that would challenge that, people who've been deadened by immorality. And God says, I have many people in this city. What does that mean? What's, what's God telling Paul there? He's giving Paul a peek into his secret will. He's talking about predestination. God's saying, I have, I have predestined, I have chosen, I have elected men and women, particular men and women and boys and girls in this pagan city. And Paul, I want you to continue to speak because it is going to be through your message of the gospel, through your preaching, that I'm going to, in my perfect timing, connect your words and your message with these people that I have chosen, and I'm going to bring them to faith. And so, Paul, you don't know who they are. You don't know what they look like. It may be the most unlikely characters that you meet, and yet I have many people in this city who I'm going to bring to myself. We have, to take, we have to hold on to that. That's one of the great treasures of the doctrine of, of predestination. That is that God has his people. And as we speak, even if we're afraid, God will in his time use that to draw those he's chosen to himself. When I was a young pastor, maybe um, 32 years old or so, I got a call from a woman. She called the church. She said, please come to my home. My husband is, is dying. Um, she, she was not a member. She really didn't attend church much. She'd looked us up in the yellow pages and her husband was a retired engineer. He was dying of cancer. The doctor had said, you've got a few days to live. So I went to the home and she was, you know, an emotional basket case. And he was just sitting there just like a granite stone. And he said, um, I want you to understand one thing. You're here for her and not for me. I don't want to have anything to do with religion. And I was scared of him. I mean, he had a, uh, a sharp intellect still, even though he was very ill. I was afraid of his almost hostile uh, reaction to, to, to me and to the Christian faith. I was afraid of the, the raw physical pain that was kind of coming out of every pore. And so I punted. I mean, I, I, I kind of turned to her and, and read the 23rd Psalm and, and I ran out with a tail between my legs. And um, man, I felt terrible. I thought, I, you know, what kind of a Christian am I? So uh, <clears throat> I went back the next day <clears throat> and his son was there. And um, <clears throat> I said, look, your wife wanted me to talk to you. And so I think it'd be respectful to her if, if you heard me out. I kind of hid behind her petticoats. And um, so I read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you know, that starts out, you're dead in your transgressions and sin. You're, you're a, by nature, a, a child of wrath. And so I said, hey, this means you're a sinner. You deserve God's punishment. And his son said, don't say that about my father. He's a good man. And the old man held, held up his hand like this to his son. And he said, no, no, wait a minute. I need to hear this. I think it might be true. And I just went right through those. Again, you know, God who's rich in mercy, uh, it's by grace you're saved through faith. I mean, the whole shebang. And he at the end said, I'm a, I'm a sinner, you know, what do I do? How do I get God's forgiveness? Just like that. Why did it happen that way? Because God in eternity past had chosen that man for salvation. He was one of God's people. 
And then at that time, even though words were spoken with some fear and trembling, God connected those words to this man and brought him to faith. Sometimes God works that way, sometimes he doesn't. I mean, it was telling to me, and I've never forgotten, at his funeral, I shared this story, and afterwards this woman came running up to me. She said, I'm his cousin. For years, I've tried to share the gospel with him, and he cut me off, wouldn't talk to me. I've just prayed for him. So here she was. For years, she had faithfully, fearlessly prayed for her cousin. And, and God used that as well, but for whatever reason, it was, it was my words in his perfect time. What an encouragement that is to you, uh, that, that uh, when you're afraid, know that as you speak and are not silent, as, as you do what God calls you to do, that in his perfect sovereign will, uh, he connects you to those who he has called and chosen. Now, I said in this point, God has many people in Fort Lauderdale. I, I don't know that. I have no idea who God's elect are. I don't know how many he has. But I do know this, there's a history of the Holy Spirit's work in this, in this town. And we do know that as God's words goes forth, it, it goes in power and it irresistibly draws God's people to himself. So this is a promise that God has many people that you need to hold on to and cling to when you're, when you're dealing with people who, who make you afraid. Uh, remember this and speak. Well, listen, we, we are living in dangerous times, aren't we? Uncertain times. I mean, nations are in, in an uproar. There is wickedness in, in, in high places. Lots of reasons to, to be fearful. Lots of reasons to be afraid. Lots of things to cause anxiety. But what does God's word say over and over again? Do not be afraid. Let me, let me share one time that that, is, that message is given. It's in Luke 12. Jesus Christ is speaking to us and he says, do not be afraid, little flock, for it pleases my heavenly Father to give you the kingdom. So let those words go in deep. Let's pray together. We give you thanks, O Lord, for this magnificent uh, command that you have given throughout your word over and over again, over a hundred times, to not be afraid. We pray that you would bring that home to every fearful heart here this morning. Uh, there's so many things to, to, to alarm us, but I pray that uh, as your people, we would remember your, your great and, and awesome uh, promises, that you are with us, <clears throat> that you'll keep us from harm, and that you have many people that you are bringing into your kingdom. Oh, we want to be a part of that. We pray that you would uh, do your work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.